Next up, Eileen Bresnahan. I think I'm getting that last name right. She'll tell us here for sure. Eileen, I know that much is right, is a philosophy professor at the University of Dayton. She grew up studying ballet. Her specialty is the philosophy of dance, and she is often asked what that is and why it matters by well-meaning people on airplanes. <laughs> Eileen's presentation is, is an attempt to answer those questions. Eileen. Right. Okay, so what philosophy wants to know, um, among other things, is often what the nature of something is. So um, in a definitional project, it would be, what is X that is X alone and that is not also Y? Um, what is the essence of X? And that comes from ancient Greek Western philosophy to try to do a definitional project like that. So let's try it with an apple. We could start off with a provisional definition and say, an apple's a round fruit that grows on a tree. Is it true? Yeah, apples are round. Do they grow on trees? Yeah, okay. So that's a good place to start, right? But that can't be enough. That can't be enough to tell us, to isolate what's apple about, um, about an apple. Um, because uh, we have a round fruit that grows on a tree, that's clearly not an apple. All right, so now we have to refine the definition to avoid this counterexample. So now we might say, and I do this with my students you know, in intro class, let's say an apple's a red round fruit that grows on a tree. So now what do you have to do? You have to find a red round fruit that grows on a tree, it's not an apple. And it, so it goes, right? So then we might say, okay, well, um, now an apple's a red round fruit that has more than one seed. I got it, I got it now. We have defined apple, right? Until somebody gives you another counterexample that comes from a direction you're not expecting. All right, now we gotta get rid of red. And now I gotta think, oh yeah, there's yellow apples too. Oh no, and it keeps going and going and going. And some of you were probably already thinking, uh, more than one seed, that would also have been pomegranates. Pomegranates would have messed up that cherry example, right? And so eventually you're gonna get a whole list of things that are things that it shares with other things, those are called contingent features, and things that are just with, with the apple, and you have a larger understanding of what the apple is after you do this. So as a philosopher of dance, I try to do the same thing with dance. And so uh, the project then becomes to start somewhere and figure out what we're going to say about dance. Um, this feels like it is longer than 20 seconds. Um, <laughs> I practice this. And did, did there, is there a delay here on this one? OK, there we go. All right, so let's start with, let's say, all right, let's do something easy. Object or phenomenon, OK? Uh, let's say that statue is an object. And uh, that's moving. So we're going to call that a phenomenon. Dancers moving. And I have seen postmodern dances where people just stand there. And so th there are exceptions to even do this. But let's just say most dances, they move. OK, it's a phenomenon. Is it natural? Is it a tornado? Is it a storm? Um, or is it a cultural phenomenon, like taking selfies? Um, something that human beings make that wouldn't be in the world without human beings and the world of culture and language. Um, that would be a cultural phenomenon. Um, so which one do you think it is? Cultural, right? So then we start looking for different cultures and looking for examples of dance in different cultures, and we find them everywhere. Um, and then we might also say, OK, you know what? Besides cultural phenomenon, let's also throw in something else. Let's say that it's also an art, if we use a non-fine arts definition of art, where art is a practice skill um, with a certain history and a certain style. Um, and now let's look at other cultural phenomenon. All right, that's the ice bucket challenge. Um, and that's a holy celebration in India that happens in spring to celebrate love. Um, so these are, you know, also mass phenomenons where things are happening, but they're clearly not dance. So we need to probably stick with the art side of things. Um, but now we have other arts that are not dance. We have Nina Simone singing jazz. We have Sir Ian McKellen as King Lear in Shakespeare doing theater. Um, so now we have to distinguish dance as art um, from other arts. So maybe we want to say what's special about dance that the other arts have in, to a lesser degree is that involves a moving human body. And that's Desmond Richardson, who I went to high school with, who is way much cooler than me, much more cooler than me. Um, he's the director of uh, Complexions Ballet. So if we say something primary about dance is that it involves a moving human body, now we have to look for counterexamples of things that involve a moving human body that is not dance, sports. 
All right, so this is a long jump competition, and especially in a still photo, it looks very dance-like. It looks like that might be a dance jump, right? Um, but it's sports. So we have another thing that is a contingent feature of dance that it involves a moving human body. Um, but now we have another problem. It's not always human. If we want to say that this hippopotamus, and I don't know the difference between an alligator and a crocodile, but let's go with alligator, in Fantasia are dancing, um, then it may be that uh, the moving body is not always human, and so we want to refine further to include other things. Um, and we can, might want to also say that typical of dance, not always because of that film, um, dance will put you in the presence of a live audience, or it will put the live audience in the presence of a live person. Um, so now we have to think of other things that put you in the presence of a live audience that are not dance. Um, that in order to refine this definition further, and we get pro wrestling, which is complicated by the fact that it is choreographed. <laughs> they know who will win. It has costumes. It has music. It has. It is might be bad art. It might be art. But we might want to say no. It's entertainment. We can always move something away from art that we don't like by calling it entertainment. And it might not involve a live person or live audience, right? There might be no human body or person at all in digital dance, and that's a digital painting on the right that may not have ever have had a human subject in it. But they'll call it a, a line dance. That painting is actually called line dance if it has movement. Um, so we collect everything that we've gotten so far, and we'll say, okay, dance is at least a cultural phenomenon and an art that usually exists at the side of a moving body, but not always. It's typically experienced in the presence of a live person, but not always. Um, can have a, a human involved, but not always. Um, can be live, but not always. Um, and then um, we ask ourselves, all right, well, now we have this huge collection of things, do we understand dance? And now that we've moved on since ancient Greece, we can say, well, no, there's the phenomenological aspect, the what something is like aspect of something that can only be understood if you experience it. Um, so um, if you want to say that a certain phenomenon can't be understood unless you experience it, like parenting, try to explain that to somebody without a kid, or the taste of chocolate if they haven't had it, or love, or swimming in a swimming pool, or what blue looks like if you're a blind person, or the, or the feeling of fire. Um, and if, that as if those aspects are needed in order to understand the phenomenon, um, and the then we go back full circle to the apples. And I also put as one of the slides um, um, an apple in a symbolic function, which would take you to the next stage, which is what functions, what kinds of things does it do um, beyond the experiential. And that's what I do for a living. That's philosophy of dance. <laughs> Really interesting. I love it when uh, science and art mix. That's, that's really cool.